Hello, hello again. Uh, let's talk with our man in Brussels, the man with the bow tie, Peter van der Heiden. Um, Peter, you are welcome, first of all. Um, you are counseling universities when they apply for funds and you write policy papers to help even the European Commission to uh, assemble their own thoughts. Um, one question for you before you help us understand this university policy we have been starting with. Um, we have just heard the news about the multi-annual framework um, um, budget of the EU and that uh, Monsieur Laroutourou, a French um, member of the parliament, is on hunger strike because he demands more money for the uh, research and education budget and he also uh, demands a 0.1 tax on, um, I think, on stock exchange and uh, money transfer, uh, yeah, trading of stocks and bonds and like a little small contribution of the rich to the European budget. Um, but actually, you, are, you know so well the European Commission and what goes on there. Do you know what these current uh, debates, discussions um, on the budget really mean? Who's, whose interests are conflicting there? It is, it is a traditional pushing and pulling between Parliament uh, and, and Council and Commission. And the Commission is ambitious also on the own income, this, this uh, form of tax, uh, of which you gave one example of taxing the, the big uh, companies of uh, social media. Uh, the Commission is also in favor of, of uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Commission, eh? so I'm looking as an independent, and I, uh, uh, but even when I worked there, it was always pushing and pulling. Commission is ambitious, Parliament is even more ambitious, you could say over ambitious, but that's that's always good. And then the, the council is pulling back and the council of ministers and the heads of state and government, they have a uh, they're responsible for their national budget. Maybe the education and research minister wants to give more to Erasmus and Horizon, but the finance minister does not. So it's a you know, pushing and pulling. It's looking for alternative sources like the next generation, this, this recovery fund. Uh, it's playing with time. You can say, well, less money now, more money in future. Uh, something will come out. It will be more than we had before. It will be less than we had hoped for. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the last um, uh, Horizon budget was 80 billion. Now, um, uh, Monsieur Laroutourou um, wants 39 billion more for um, Horizon Europe and uh, Erasmus um, sounds a lot. And um, is it realistic? How do you, what, what does these numbers mean, actually? N not, not the total that the, 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 the parliament wants or this, this member of parliament, but something will come out in the end. It's also in the interest of the member states. The more you invest in education innovation, the better you come out economically later on. So I think mm. they, there's a strong awareness of that. We have the additional fund of 750 billion. It's almost a doubling of the EU budget. And we must try to gear that towards topping up our education and research innovation programs and doing other things that have uh, the, 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 the color and the taste of innovation. And if universities, European university alliances position themselves well, come with plans, I always learned money follows ideas. Oh, uh, when we talked before, you said that the European University Initiative um, money, the five millions they get for three years, plus uh, the Horizon Europe, two million, um, and maybe other sources. You said this money is a lot, but not enough really to make um, decisive stains, uh, changes. You said, um, but it's a good benchmarking exercise. Um, I don't really understand what you meant by this. Can you explain? Well, first of all, the money, uh, I always try to annoy my audience, the money is too much. Uh, five million from Erasmus, two million for Horizon, to organize your modernization. It's not to do a lot, it's to make plans, to put structures in place. And it's money to meet, basically. And as you know, we cannot meet. So the money has even doubled, more or less, thanks to COVID because now you can spend it on more useful things if the eligibility rules of the commission allow you to do so. So 5 million, no, let's say 7 million, that's what the commissioner says, because he's responsible for Erasmus and Horizon. She says 7 million to talk with your six partners about getting your house in order. That's a lot, that's a lot. 
you cannot run a faculty for seven million, seven, uh, but you, uh, you, can, you can prepare the plans. The real money, of course, will then have to come from other sources, the rest of Horizon, the European Structural and Investment Funds, meaning that our colleagues in the poor regions of Europe are the rich members of the European University Alliances, because they can really build new campuses with that structural fund money. And as I said before, we have the 715 billion of Ursula or of uh, Michel of the Council and the, and the Commission, which they now desperately are looking for meaningful ways to spend. So mm. I, would not, mm. I would not worry about the money, I would worry about your ideas. Make sure that you have very good ideas. And those you can learn from the benchmarking. That was your question. If yes, you sit yes. together in an alliance of seven, one has the better, best library, one has the most best HR, the best incentive system for staff, one has the smoothest student admission. Well, after three years, after five years, I would expect all seven to be as good as the best one in the group. And that is a very important uh, task of the European universities, benchmarking next to the fact that they are supposed to integrate part of their missions, not all their missions, but part of. So that's the, the double assignment. Get your act together, modernize, and do some integration. Well, Peter, thank you so far. I think we are now um, opening up to our other two guests, uh, Vanessa de Biesanton and um, Case Kovenar. Um, um, Monsieur de, uh, Madame de Biesanton and Gerta Herr um, Kovenar, are you with us? Yes, I can start in the meanwhile. Um, uh, Madame de Vieux-Santon is the head of the higher education unit um, at the European Commission. She studied chemi chemical engineering and also worked for chemical companies before she went into the European Commission. Um, tomorrow she will gather um, all the rectors of the University Alliance for a big um, meeting because the second batch of 24 more University Alliances have been recently selected. And our second uh, partner in this second half of our debate is Case Kovenar. He's a, um, an, an expert of internationalization for, because he works there for a long time. He's Secretary General of the Aurora Alliance, also a new university alliance. Um, he graduated in history. Um, he worked for NUFIC. This is kind of the Dutch-British um, Council. Um, and um, he lives in Amsterdam and loves cycling with his wife. Um, so, do we have the other members of the, of the debate present? Let's see, a uh, case is there. Um, I'm not seeing uh, um, Miss Debier Santon yet. She's there. She's there? Good. Uh, Miss, uh, Madame Debier Santon, bonjour. Oh, guten Tag. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh um, 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 welcome, uh, welcome to our, to our um, conversation. It um, um, was very interesting, was very in, interesting the in the beginning with, with Daniela. Daniela and um, Ludovic. Um, you are now um, speaking uh, from and for the European Commission. Um, uh, maybe it's interesting for the, for the listeners to understand how uh, this works. Um, the European Commission executes what the European governments want. And you told me that this um, European uh, University initiative was something after um, uh, Macron um, presented it in his speech in the Sorbonne in 2017. Um, maybe it was an idea. Um, uh, you told me that this special, the special thing about these alliances were that they're a bottom-up initiative. So that would mean that the university sector, the universities, uh, the people in the universities um, shaped the program, uh, helped uh, shaping the program too. Uh, can you a little bit explain how this mechanism works and um, where, where are we now? Yes, thank you very much for your question, uh, Tino. So indeed, everything started uh, with the speech of uh, Emmanuel Macron to create these European universities. And of course, 
everybody was very pleased that suddenly education is becomes very high on the political agenda. This uh, had not been the case for, for many years. At the same time, um, the wide and diverse higher education community were wondering but what it is, because all the universities are European somehow. So then we gathered uh, a, a diverse uh, um, experts from the high education community uh, with uh, many networks, Aurora and the Coimbra group uh, were, were part of these uh, stakeholders. And we started to co-create this new initiative together to say, look, we have an opportunity, let's check it, to do things that we have always dreamed to do, but we never had the, the resources or the funding to do it. So we started together dreaming. And at the beginning, we dreamt in very different directions, as you can imagine, because we have a very diverse landscape in Europe with very diverse needs. But then the longer term we looked at, and then the more convergent were the ideas were. And this is how we came up together with this concept of European universities, which aims not at do what we already do now, but we are aiming at doing what, what, what is not happening yet. And I was very pleased by listening to, to Ludovic and to Daniela before. They gave very good uh, examples of what these European universities are about. First, this is not a European project, you know, that you give funding for three years and then if you're lucky it continues, but um, in many cases, then they, can, they cannot continue. So here it's not a project, it's a long-term initiative. What we have been asking them is to dream about the universities of the future, what they want to be together. So an alliance of about seven higher education institutions from all parts of Europe, what they want to become in 10, 20 years time. The novelty already and the impact in it will answer one of the previous questions on what is really the international uh, impact. Well, what we have seen in these partnerships is that already it has created new new partnerships. Because before, if you looked at the mapping um, in this cooperation, international cooperation, it was very much either Western-centered or Eastern-centered, but we didn't have really uh, strong partnerships bringing northern, southern, eastern and western uh, partners together. So that's already one transformational aspect. The second one, as, as Ludovic and Daniela explained before, is really to transform the way we teach and the way we learn. And this has even more accelerated with the COVID-19, moving all their learning teaching activities online. No one was prepared with such a change so, so quickly. And what we have uh, learned from the European universities is that more than 90, 96% of them, well, all of them, think that actually if their European universities had already been in place, they would have been much better prepared uh, for, this, uh, for this pandemic as they are setting up uh, in European entire university campuses, meaning that a student in let's say in Berlin, in the University of Berlin, they will not have access only to the courses of Berlin University, but they will have access to the courses of all the other partners across Europe. So it's really a huge, a huge benefit. So in terms of impact, it has a huge leverage impact when it comes to mobility, whether it is physical, um, virtual or blended, because here we are addressing at the full population of the students of these universities. And it has a huge leverage in terms of the structural and transformational uh, impact structurally in these universities to really structurally transform the way they teach and the way they learn and the way they do research. And because as Ludovic explained very well, we're speaking about the knowledge square, meaning that here we are looking at the transformation and the four different missions of universities, education, research, innovation, and service to society. So we are very- um, um, Vanessa? Let me, ask, let me ask here, it's interesting. Um, someone has a question that I also had. Um, uh, there's, um, there has been the, in the beginning the, the question how these university alliances should be shaped. 
Some were more tending toward an elite um, model, like the Ivy League in America, and some were more, more tending to, to do something on the broad scale, as it is now with 280 universities participating. That is one in 11 in the European Union and one in 14 in the, all over Europe. So for now, you have a very broad program. However, the question here is, is this um, University Alliance initiative um, something like the German Alex um, Excellency initiative, like something that wants to create special universities that have more money and who leave the others behind? Well, the objective that has been set up by the, by the head of state, heads of governments, and also with their uh, minist ministers responsible for higher education, was to have uh, an initiative that is as inclusive as possible. Inclusive in terms of geographical balance, meaning that all the member states should be part of it. Inclusive in terms of the types of high education institutions, so not only the top research leading universities, but also universities of applied sciences, for example. And inclusive in terms of the accessibility to a wide range of students. But this inclusivity doesn't mean that they're not excellent. It all depends how you define excellence. It's excellence not only in top research, it's excellence in the way you deliver teaching and learning, in the way you're going to set in place completely new innovative pedagogies, in the way you're going to involve all the, as Ludovic explained before, all your surrounding innovation ecosystem working together with the cities, with the regions, with the surrounding companies. And we believe that um, inclusion and excellence are the two uh, aspects of the same cone and that they are reinforcing each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's even another question which is very interesting from our um, viewers. Um, Anonymous says, given the current discussion on migration, climate change, etc., does it make sense to have an European university and what is so specific about it? Asked um, all these European universities to think about, okay, what is their strategy for the future? On which uh, topics do they want to train their, their, their students? Not only so topics, but how they're going to implement this challenge-based approach. Meaning that uh, um, one of the transformation is of course to, to, to train uh, students on very specific disciplines and to develop uh, an expertise for each of them, but to go even beyond that so that they are able together as uh, students from different disciplines with different expertise to be able to work together on big challenges like, like climate change. Many of them among the 41 European universities have sustainable development and tackling uh, climate change at the core of their strategy, meaning that they will have students from different disciplines that will work with academics, with researchers, with the cities, with the regions with the companies to tackle very concrete challenges that their cities or their regions are facing. Now, we also, because we can understand the question in many different ways, it could be that uh, traveling, etc., is not good for climate. So this is why we are also developing a green uh, future Erasmus program, uh, meaning that we will uh, support and we will encourage a greener transport when it comes to mobility, but we're also going to support blended mobility, so which means uh, shorter uh, physical mobility blended with virtual mobility. So all this will contribute to preserve the, the climate. A third element as well will be that, you know, so far to organize the mobility, we used a lot of paper. Now, this is something of the past with the European Student Card Initiative, we are aiming at uh, um, digitalizing all this process to organize the mobility by allowing this uh, interoperability between all the diversity of IT systems of universities across Europe so that they, all these systems will be able to speak to each other. And this is what the Erasmus Plus uh, Erasmus Without Paper uh, project is, is aiming at. Wow. Well, I need... 
15 more of these debates to clear this up. Uh, let me, let me uh, switch for a moment to uh, Kees Kovenaar, who is joining us from Amsterdam and who is the um, um, Secretary General Coordinator of the Aurora Initiative. Um, Aurora has all these keywords also in their project uh, description. Um, um, Mr. Kovenaar, uh, you are an expert of internationalization. So, um, um, I, I, I like the project description of um, Aurora a lot. Um, um, what would you say in one sentence or two at least, uh, at maximum, what is the unique aspect of your alliance? What makes it, what, 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 what is emerging from it, from the others? Is she not there, she not the there at the moment? Kiss well, your well. message. You need to uh -huh. mute yourself. Yes, mute. Yes. Mute. Ah, yes. No, before uh, it was Berlin that could mute and unmute me, but now I'm. Uh, I have become independent, like Peter. Hello, welcome. Hello, welcome. <laughs> Hi. Um, yes, I. Uh, I need to speak in one sentence about the network before I move to the alliance. Aurora was founded in 2016. Uh, so before uh, President Macron's speech, to actually do very similar things as were now in the whole idea of the European University Initiative. Um, we were founded as a group of universities who came together to help each other to become better at, one, at what they want to be good at. And for Aurora universities, this means better at matching academic excellence with societal relevance. It's a group of universities that fights the idea that academic excellence and societal relevance are each other's enemies. And international collaboration in Aurora has never been an objective per se. It is a tool to that end, not a separate objective. It is a high trust network, which allows universities to openly talk about their weaknesses and their challenges in a way they feel they cannot do that with their domestic competitors. And this will not change with the Alliance. But the core of the Alliance program is that we say, we need to equip our students, our graduates, with not only the academic and the subject specific knowledge, but with the skills and the horizontal mindsets to help them to be able and willing to address the big challenges in society. And the key tool in our Alliance program is what we call the Aurora Competence Framework and is based on the analysis that in higher education at large, in our universities in Europe, in the world, we are still not good enough in finding clear expression in how good our students need to be when they graduate not just in chemistry or history, but also in critical thinking, in group work, in inquiry and analysis, in taking risks. And this framework will develop a set of expressions which academics can choose from to build these horizontal learning outcomes into their curricula across the Aurora universities and any other university that would like to use them to create a language a common language and a common toolbox for learning outcomes in horizontal competencies. So that's that's what we're all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I remember when uh, Macron held a speech, um, his um, definition of these European universities was more vague. But one thing he said, it was the multilingual aspect. He wanted the students to learn at least two extra languages. Um, I didn't look it up, but I want to know, is, is, has Aurora an answer to the language question? It is our task team 3.3.2 which is called plurilingual languages. When writing the proposal, I have learned that there is a major conceptual difference between plurilingualism and multilingualism. Uh, we have a group that is developing all kinds of tools to help our students to develop their competence, their plurilingual competence, not only in the second, but also in a third European language, yes. So I suppose, so I suppose um, there, there is there um, language courses um, included in the other uh, mobility programs, or how does it work? 
understand that question. Can you repeat? Well, 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 um, well um, if, um, I if I am a student now in your network and I'm participating, and I'm participating, in, a course participating in a course or, in an, or in an activity that the Aurora network offers, um, I'm now speaking one other language and perhaps I would need another one. Um, uh, practically, how, how would you, uh, do you know how the, the, the network wants to implement multilingualism or polylingualism in their activities? It is an excellent question and the honest answer is no. Um, actually, the Alliance has officially started this week, 1st of November. Um, tomorrow and the day after, we have our launching virtual meeting with many of the task teams. Um, plurilingualism is, is not one of them, but they are now going to make their plans to create tools for the universities to have uh, to give students opportunities to learn languages. But let me underline, the core of our Alliance program is not focused on moving bodies. Mm -hmm. The core mm -hmm. of our Alliance is to give all the nine universities to, to the tools to improve the education, the teaching and learning processes within their universities. And that also includes international mobility. But it includes more mobility. The focus is making the normal education better in all our universities. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I would ask you a policy question because you, uh, you were talking about the learning outcomes before as a measurement of success. Um, or of, of advancement, um, the European program for these university alliances has evolved. It was a first call, there was a second call in which you were successful with your alliance, and it will evolve further. Um, uh, what, what are your proposals for the further development of this program? What should be in there, what's not in yet, or how should it be better? Um, I, I think um, Peter van der Heide once uh, told me that the European Commission is, of course, at the end of the day, more interested in supporting the domestic, regional improvement of higher education in its own context than in the transnational cooper cooperation, which is always a small outer skill for all of the universities. But because of their position, they have to focus strongly on the transnational dimension, because that is their given political role. Um, I would like to argue that in the further development of these um, corporations, these European university initiatives, we keep our main focus on helping our universities to serve their community as well as they possibly can at city level, regional level, national level, European level and global level. Uh, and not uh, put all our um, eggs in the basket of the transnational European dimension. It is. It should flow from the national, the, the natural objectives of the universities, and not be positioned as a priority. It can be made a priority for the administrators, for the rectors. It will never become a, a priority for the academics who want to go on doing what they. Uh, what they are self-motivated for. Ah, ah um, this is a point what I, where I would like to return to Vanessa, uh, Vanessa de Biesenton for a moment, because in fact this um, question before about the European identity and dimension um, demands for it. Um, um, Monsieur de, uh, de Biesenton, um, can you say something uh, about this program, how it reaches out, um, so that we are not so Eurocentric all the time, how it reaches out um, to countries and um, uh, universities beyond the European Union. Um, can you specify on this, uh, how far the program does it? I know um, Istanbul is in and, and, and England, but um, how, how does this program go further than the European Union? Well, so far, uh, the initiative is open to all the Erasmus Plus uh, program countries. So 33 uh, countries, including those that you mentioned, we were very happy to welcome Norway, Iceland, uh, Turkey, even, even Serbia. Uh, so this is the current scope of this initiative. Now, you know that we have announced that we're going to roll out this initiative under the next uh, MFF, so with the next uh, Erasmus program in synergy with the Horizon Europe and, and other European program. So then here the scope will be discussed once more time with the member states. But in the meantime, 
each of these universities, so we are currently, we have currently more than 284 higher education institutions if involved in these 41 European universities. Each of them have their own network, you know, with whom they cooperate, not only within Europe, but also beyond. And it's obvious that all their partners beyond Europe will benefit from this alliance because, because they will benefit from the transformation that they are going to put in place, which means that also the staff, the researchers, the students who will cooperate with them will not only cooperate with the University of Berlin, but they will cooperate with all the, the partners from the European University where Berlin University is, is involved, for example. So it completely changed the, the, the perspective and they are very much looking at it uh, with, uh, with is uh, a lot of interest and we know already that uh, uh, many universities uh, beyond Europe would like to, to see how they could be even more involved in this initiative. But of course, this is not the decision of the Commission. This is a decision to be taken with, uh, with the Member States. Oh, well, this is interesting. Oh. Maybe I should make an inquiry on how um, um, the universities in South America and in Africa, how they perceive this initiative. And, and, and after a few years, we ask how much they have been involved. This would be really interesting. Um, um, I'd like to, Peter von der Heiden, I see uh, you're, um, you're keen on, on intervening with, with some um, uh, critical questions. What, what were your thoughts while we were talking with uh, Ms. Debye Santon and the case Kovinar so far? You're muted, Peter. Ah. Ah. <laughs> like Trump. Like Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Bottom left. Okay. Uh, uh, let's to Vanessa and Case, and also to uh, Daniela and Ludovic. Uh, you see this interesting tension, or not a tension, it's, it's a combination of things. Uh, it is bo it's both uh, uh, big and, s and small, nitty gritty. Eh? Uh, European universities are uh, for the big, sh big boys and girls the big shots, and it's for the staff and the students. Uh, why is it big? Uh, why is it interesting for presidents and rectors? Because what Daniela said is not a project. It's a transformation of your university through the participation in an alliance. Very different animal. It's an, it's an immediate organization, an alliance. It's doing things. It's not only talking. But and. That's why the president comes in. In German, it's called uh, chef. Eh? So it's chef Sache. It's something for the prime minister or for the rector or for the president. Why? Because it's about it's geo geopolitical. It's geopolitical in the big sense. It's, it's positioning Europe in the world. Can we come out stronger? It's positioning your university in your region. And what alliance should you join to position yourself now and in the future? That's for the, for the big boys. For the staff members, it is also relevant because they are the professionals that run the alliance. Every uh, alliance has 30, 40 staff teams. In case Cowan was mentioning that the staff teams were going to meet. And those are the professionals that make the change. Uh, directors of studies, library deputies, HR officials, student admission specialists. They will make the student admission system of Aurora work. Or the, or the HR uh, uh, mobility scheme of, of UFA, thanks to those people. And they have now, thanks to Vanessa, thanks to Macron, they have a career in a European perspective. Of course, they, most of them will stay home, but some will do a secondment or even pursue their career at the partner institution. That makes it interesting for the big boys and for the workers on the floor. Now, my question is to the panel and to all of us in the coming year, is this enough? Is this enough to substantially, and now let's use the names of our alliances, is this enough to substantially reuvenate our higher education? Is it substantial enough to engage, to enhance, to enlighten, and maybe even to charm? That's, that's <laughs> the question. And uh, can our systems uh, really become better this bottom-up way? I think they can, the benchmarking is important, but I would like to leave two ideas on the table. One is a rotating grant. We now have 41 grants for 41 alliances who are already building themselves up like trade unions to get more money after. But I would say, well, let's make it a rotating grant and invite new ones or kick out one third and get one third new in. Because we don't have uh, the Fachhochschule alliances, not enough, the, the schools of applied sciences. We miss the military academies. 
we miss a number of, of uh, what I call system relevant institutions that could also benefit from the blessings of, of the, the curse of being a, a European University Alliance. So that's one idea, a rotating grant, not for tomorrow, but for the year to come to think about. And the second one, we should explore the Swiss question. And the Swiss question is that Switzerland has good education, high education in all cantons, most of them, but they have two universities that stand out. And they were, uh, it's APFL in Lausanne. Mr. Kovinar, uh, what's, your, what's your reaction to these um, many ideas of Peter van der Heyden? Uh, a policy making one or two single high peaks by carving out the valleys uh, among them, because then you would lower the average quality. So that, that's one thing. The, the other comment that I have, um, I think it relates to what you say in some way, um, citing an Israeli historian, Yuval Harari, uh, one of many who said, uh, reality is a narrative. Universities do not exist. Universities are simply narratives that exist as long as we are convinced that the narrative has some value and some merit. Um, but universities are very different narratives to very different groups. The, the university narrative for academics, for researchers, for teachers, for students, for administrators, for leaders, for alumni, for external stakeholders are vastly different narratives. The European University Alliance, and that's my bridge to what you say, will become a, a paradigm changing development like Erasmus was in 87 and Bologna was uh, 10 years later, only if there is enough conviction in the various distinct narratives for these groups of stakeholders to carry on the burden themselves. I, I be, I'm in, in favor of your rota rotating uh, fund. I think the European University Alliance, the Erasmus, uh, the, the Aurora uh, Alliance uh, cannot depend on Brussels money. It can only succeed if there is enough intrinsic motivation, not just with the rector or the administrators, but with the academics and the students. And it must be something that we do because we want to do it ourselves. The Commission gives us some support to help us do what we want to do ourselves anyway. That's the only way forward. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I would um, like to, would like um, to ask um, the last, last question last also question to also Monsieur, uh, <laughs> Madame um, uh, Debier saint um, Is there also a perception in the European Commission that this European University Alliance initiative is, um, is a further step, is like a natural uh, further step after Rasmus, after the Bologna process, like a historical um, further development of the way uh, European uh, universities and European higher education um, is uh, evolving? Is there, a, is there an idea of this, like a, like a progress that now must enter into these university alliances, uh, Madame uh, de Vies saint -Ton. How is the How is the idea in the European Commission about this? 
Yes, absolutely, uh, Tino. That's exactly uh, the way we see it. Um, in international cooperation, you start generally with mobility. The strategic partnership. Then a little bit more ambitious, you have Erasmus Mundus and you have uh, the knowledge uh, alliances. And then very, very ambitious, the most ambitious, which has never existed before, are the European universities. And we have a lot of ambition with this initiative, not only to, to transform the, the, the wide high education landscape and diverse high education landscape, as, as Peter uh, and, and Keith explained, but also to make it a reality so, and uh, here I come back to the, to the question of Peter, to make it a reality, we will need uh, all these universities, of course, we need the support of their national governments, and they will need the support of the European Commission. How? Because, of course, they will need not only all the top leaders of these universities to be on board, but also all their students and staff, because as Peter said, rightly so, they are the one who will uh, basically implement all the activities, but we need as well to continue to implement even further the Bologna process. For example, when it comes to accreditation or quality assurance, we are not yet there. And this is why we see this initiative as a catalyst for change. Um, and this is why we will meet tomorrow all the rectors and coordinators of these uh, European universities together with the directors general responsible for higher education especially at this point. How can we make qualifications and accreditation more fit for purpose, more modern, to meet you know, the, the objective of these European universities? Um, what kind of uh, the head of state and Emmanuel Macron asked us to create a European degree does not exist now. We need to co-create it together. Um, the European universities told us that when putting in resources, data, infrastructure together, they need a specific legal legal statute. So we're going to explore together with them a European legal statute for them. Um, we are also looking at, um, you know, the, the, with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, the labor market transformation is accelerating even more than before when it comes to the digital and, and the green transition. So we need to upskill, reskill the labor workforce and the role of higher education is absolutely key. So we, we're working as well to develop financials. So all this requires, um, requires a lot of ambition, a lot of vision at European, national and institutional level. Um, so the road will be bumpy, but all together I'm convinced that we can, that we can make it. So this is our vision for the future that we have expressed in the recent communication on achieving a European education year by 2025 and with the Digital Education Action Plan to support as well universities in the digital <laughs> Well, thank you for this overview. In fact, I would like to slowly close the debate um, um, and thank you all for your participation. Um, I might like to say the small thing, um, which is also the historical dimension of this thing. Um, one of my historical heroes actually um, comes from the city of uh, Daniela Trani from Naples. Um, it's Federico II, uh, Friedrich II, a king of Sicily and of uh, Germany uh, in the early 13th century. And he was the first to found a non-religious um, university, a university independent from the Pope, uh, his great adversary, in 1224. Um, this university uh, was, um, if I'm not wrong, um, the 12th university in Europe um, before it was Bologna and pa Paris, of course, and they were all dominated by the Pope. And um, Federico's um, reign, his uh, monarchy, was the most advanced and well-organized of his time. And why? Because he had um, well-trained uh, administration and people, and he wanted to further this um, um, this good um, policy by building this uh, first like university in um, Na Naples and Napoli. And well, I have a feeling that these um, European university alliances could be examples and could work out models that help all the other universities who are not in the alliances too. I am very optimistic that um, uh, there will be very uh, many interesting news to tell about their uh, projects, models and uh, initiatives. And I hope we can be part of this with this um, conversational format. Um, 
I want to thank you all for the participation today. Um, we have read the most uh, interesting and highest rated questions from Slido, and I thank also the participants from the, uh, from the wider audience who are on YouTube. And well, um, see you again in December. Um, and well, good day and good luck for everybody. Thank you for watching.